Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, yeah. So, thank you for welcoming me, and um, thank. Uh, I want to welcome also all the biologists in the room that came for this presentation. I hope you won't be disappointed. So, uh, well, obviously we are here in the beautiful city of Zurich in Switzerland, and we support a broad community of uh, researchers and a broad community of students uh, with our clusters. And if I don't show you this slide with all these Nobel Prize winners, I might be fired, so I needed to do it. So let's see what, which clusters are we managing. Uh, we have mainly two clusters. Uh, one is located in Lugano at uh, CSCS. And this cluster has many nodes. It's a classical HPC cluster. Um, we have uh, now uh, two, two petabytes of Luster uh, uh, 2.10. It is a DDN release. And this is a general purpose HPC. In uh, Zurich, we have uh, Leonard. So Leonard, it is our most special cluster uh, because Leonard um, doesn't have many, many nodes. But however, uh, it does have uh, some GPUs, and it has the biggest Luster file system we have. And it is, uh, also a, it is also dedicated for medical research, which means that we have a lot of constraints in terms of, uh, of um, confidential data, confidential medical data, and this and that. Uh, I explained a lot about this cluster last year here, so uh, I, don't, I won't focus on this cluster. All right, so now let's get to the point. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, this is more a site update than the bi biology lecture, finally, so I will speak more about file systems that are about life or about creatures. But, well, we wanted to give you a, 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 a nice site update with uh, more or less how we see today uh, the world of administering file systems and specifically a luster file system compared to some years ago. So. A few years ago, uh, you had your scratch file system. Um, basically, you set up your file system. You choose the number of uh, drives, the number of uh, servers you want. You drop it there. You open your scratch. Your users use it. You have failbacks from time to time. That was the previous way. Uh, but now it's no longer that. Now you're installing Luster. And when you're installing Luster, you don't install just the features you have. But quite often, you install also the future features that are coming with Luster. And you need to think now, how are you going to integrate these new features that are coming? Because in the life cycle of the file system, uh, you will upgrade your file system. And with your file system, you will have new possibilities coming in. Um, so there are several ways to compare. There are several ways to compare the life uh, cycle of a file system these days. One could be comparing different creatures. Um, the other I prefer most is like, um, uh, like the life of a human being uh, with childhood that at the beginning might not be easy, the setup of a system, but that then it gets, it gets more complex. Or we could even do another comparison with human evolution. Um, there are many ways to, to, to compare that. So, so why, why are we speaking about this evolution? Why are we doing now this? Uh, so first of all, the, the workloads are evolving. Uh, we see, for instance, now the AI impact on the workloads, uh, where users are doing quite often something that uh, we could define here uh, just between us as nasty workloads. Um, also, you have the file system usage that is shifting. As I said, it was a scratch. Now it's no longer scratch. You need to, you need to do other usage. Uh, also, uh, you need to, to uh, store lots of data, so the data capacity uh, is growing, obviously. Um, you have also Flash coming up, of course. We have been discussing a lot about Flash in the last years. We'll keep discussing now. Uh, many of the Luster features are focused on Flash. Um, the Flash uh, revolution uh, is related to the workloads evolving, of course, because these new workloads also can get uh, benefits from, uh, from Flash. Um, and then, as we've seen in the last years with Sebastian uh, making us all of these nice security presentations, we have uh, the security requirements are increasing, and 
we are having right now the, the requirement with our medical cluster, uh, which involves uh, all this data confidentiality and isolation. And, and finally, the network has also evolved to crazy ways where, thanks to the uh, flexibility of LNET, uh, you can have many, many different topologies, many different kind of uh, luster fast systems and clients accessing your, your network. So this is just what we've been doing in the last uh, year, year and a half. And what I wanted to highlight here is that, as you can see, we have been doing online. For instance, the first operation is the, the online addition of 80 drives, um, so eight OSTs. And my boss didn't want to take down time because it's not nice, right? So I said, oh, yeah, Luster can do it online. Um, I crossed fingers. <laughs> And we went ahead, we configured it, and yeah, it does it. So the 2,500 clients automatically see the new OSTs, and they start doing I.O., business as usual, nothing, nothing else. So adding OSTs is these days something that uh, we usually have to do, and we will have to do, I'm sure, in the, in the coming years more and more. Uh, but we went to the next step this year which is now we want to expand with servers. We have uh, a new storage system, and we want to integrate it into our file system. For this one, I was not so brave, and I took, I took some, some downtime, but I still left, uh, uh, we still left the, the file system mounted on the clients, uh, watching to see what happens when you add uh, servers with uh, many OSTs and even the, the two NDS, two additional NDS on a DNA system. It works smoothly, again. So again, this is something that we, we are now counting to do from time to time. If we need to add servers, we will do it on a live file system. We have also enabled QoS. We have also done a transparent upgrade from 2.7 to 2.10. I remind already the old times where upgrading was not so easy. Today, uh, it is really a trivial operation. Um, and then the, we have also configured and deployed LNet routers. I will speak later about that. And we went from laster.conf to lnet.conf, so dynamic LNet configuration. Um, yeah, we have also enabled, uh, by default, progressive file layouts. So, Kudos for all the Luster community and all the Luster developers that made this possible in the last years. So at the beginning, we set up our file system a year and a half ago. And it was a very basic file system, uh, which you can see as childhood. So on this, uh, this particular slide, I want to see the, so the top superhero there with the cape. This is you and me, the Luster admins, right, uh, developers. Um, so in this case, we have. Our, our business model uh, or our support model for the research community is that we are selling terabytes of storage, we are selling capacity, and we can do this thanks to, to the project quotas because there are a group of 10 users, there's a group of 50 users, five users, so they buy, uh, they buy terabytes of, uh, of data, and we can do this thanks to, to Luster, uh, to project quotas, which it is not difficult to use, but it requires some planning. Um, specifically, it requires to know uh, which ID would you, want to, would you want to have for the project quotas ID. Do you use the GID? Uh, do you use just a random ID? These are questions that are important when you're setting project quotas. Um, we finally found also that many of the things you are doing when you are creating new volumes. This is what we call volumes, but from elastic terminology, is, uh, they, these are uh, the directories. So many of the things that, that you do, um, they are repetitive. You are doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, so why don't you automate that with the scripts? It is a very stupid, very single script, but it's actually a wrapper to do just the uh, LFS project, uh, uh, LFS project design in the project um, inheritance on the, on the directory. And it is also a way to create the directory, set the quota, and all these issues. Um, so with, this was not that difficult, okay, we did it. And now we are having the requirement to support user quotas um, inside a project quota, which uh, 
for those that are aware of the of LDS KFS and XT4, I guess uh, it is not that easy. We go from a model where we have the three quota I nodes at the beginning of each device to something where we would have an undetermined number of I node uh, quotas on the of uh, of um, yeah quota I nodes on the on the device. So this probably requires a, an external tool. Um, so we evolve, and our file system then required to have isolation. This is what we have uh, called here for many years multi-tenancy. Okay, so there's nothing special, network isolation, and then you have each group can see only their own directory thanks to subdirectory mounts and, and node map, the node map feature on, on, on Luster. Again, there's nothing spectacular, but we are having again the same problem where, uh, where we have uh, things that are repetitive that we are doing once and over and over again, which is creating an node map on the MGS, which is assigning the file set, uh, which is um, modifying the routers, the LNet routers. So this is repetitive again. So this is something that uh, you can automate. You create the scripts that make them for you, and then anyone can run these things. You don't need to be a Luster admin. Um, so when it comes to router uh, configuration as well, there are two ways to go, LNet routers, virtualized LNet routers, or non-virtualized. We went through the non-virtualized LNet routers, which requires probably a configuration management, like uh, Ansible, Puppet, or in our case, we use CDs, which is more or less a homemade tool that we made some years ago. And well, we use CDs because at the time, Ansible was not that flexible or didn't provide us what we wanted. Uh, why not? Because one of the developers of CDs is in our group, so it's much easier. OK, so now let's get add some difficulties to our file system. Uh, so we have this multi-tenancy. And a few months ago, we have now this model where we have on top of each group, we have an IT admin. An IT admin that he would like to be root on the file system. But our superhero is there to protect them from harming themselves. Uh, so we cannot allow them to be root. Let's see why. Um, why, do, do, why do they want to, to be root and to manage their volume? For obvious reasons, they want to be root to modify their files or the files of their users. Um, so you can say, OK, I want to do Sage Mod, Sage On. Um, we can play with, they can play with POSIX groups, but they don't want to create POSIX groups where they can be in all possible POSIX groups and then this and that. So, yeah, that, that idea, they didn't like it that much. Uh, we could think also of a Luster node map with the admin flag, but I particularly don't like that because then these guys can say, oh, listen, I'm now root on the files, on the file, on the, on the Luster file system, and even if I just have access to my file set, I can see all quotas, and I can set all quotas. So I will buy myself 200 terabytes extra, because I deserve it. Um, we don't want to get to these situations, especially in Switzerland, where yeah, you probably don't want to, to do this kind of, of, of stealing. So yeah, we decided not to do it. Um, about other disprivileged LFS operations we have on Lasso clients, there is an LU that speaks about uh, probably uh, how to remove this uh, or how to authorize just a specific clients to do this, uh, this operation. So a um, very obvious solution that some of you might have is just re-export the, re the, the subdirectory in NFS. And then you allow them to mount on NFS. Um, you ex so we export this, uh, this, this NFS server is a VM with very reduced, um, with uh, extremely reduced capacity on CPU uh, capacity. So that means that they cannot do a lot of stuff. This is really for just doing a few uh, ch on ch mod on the files. Um, yeah, that was too easy, right? So let's add, uh, let's add another one, which is our admins now say that they want to have access to several file sets. The multi-tenant model where they have their volume, uh, they don't like it. So they want to have something like this, which is starting to be more mind-blowing, where they have 
several file sets or several node maps in the Luster terminology that are shared across groups. So, for instance, this group, Luster Bio, um, they can access their own uh, their own volume, which is only accessed by them exclusively. But they can also access the uh, the other the other data set, the other file set, which uh, uh, requires extra configuration and again uh, extra tools. So, before we get there. I have to do a confession now myself. This morning seems to be the morning of confessions. First as a gatekeeper, now as a Luster admin. So last year we were here, and yeah, on that uh, 2018 we said that you can do multi-tenancy without internet routers, uh, which is true. I didn't lie. But over the year we had several incidents and several problems. Uh, like for instance, we thought that we were going to have just new tenants every three, four months. So we could afford the changes. Uh, hopefully for us it was not the case. So we are getting regularly new tenants. We need to regularly modify uh, the file sets and the IP ranges and the VLANs, uh, which means that, um, yeah, and the routers were an advantage. Also, we had some bugs on the MGS reconfiguration because the MGS at the origin was not conceived to do uh, MGS reconfigurations every week. So we hit things that, uh, well, Maybe, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure why it happened, but uh, yeah, the MGS didn't work as expected on progressive reconfigurations and write counts. Um, yeah, we also found that there, are, there is a limit of 36 nits per device uh, on the configuration, which seemed to be fine many years ago, but nobody thought that we could do stupid things like this, so yeah. Um, so yeah, we changed our mind and we deployed the routers. Uh, because we can now have flexibility with the net routers. Um, so the model of having multiple data sets on, on, the same, on the same tenant, it is through basically this one LNet maps to one file set on each client, on each cluster client, uh, which means that uh, on the server side, we just have our several um, in this case, O2IB uh, LNets, and on the on the client side, we have just our uh, uh, Ethernet network. So, if we ha want to have two uh, file sets on the client, we need to declare two LNets. And then, um, the key of all of this, it is this option, the net the mount option, because if you don't specify this option, Luster will mount always by default the first available, we'll use the first available uh, LNet network, which means that you would be actually always mounting this file set by specifying this option. And with, of course, the proper LNet routes, uh, you can have several, you can have different directories mounted, all belonging, of course, to the same uh, file system, which is an elegant solution and which allows you to have a very high number of uh, file sets shared eventually. Of course, there's, there are dangers doing this and sharing the data sets. Um, I won't explain a lot about the dangers, but basically it's data leakage can, have, can, can, can arrive if a researcher doesn't write their data on the right place, but they write their data on the shared, on the shared place. So this is to be taken with uh, careful, especially on confidential data environments. Um, last but not least, uh, we have, um, yeah, we have this um, uh, the monitoring. How do you take care of your child or of your file system? And during this year, um, so we found on the inter on on yeah, we found on the internet this uh, a nice Luster exporter uh, provided by HP. Um, this exporter is doing a very nice job in primitives, exporting all sort of uh, of stats. And the problem we had is that when we went to Grafana, we, had, we are using Grafana, so when I, was, I, I went to the Grafana site, I could not find any dashboard that is compatible with uh, Primitives. So we developed our dashboards. Uh, we have made them available over this year on Grafana. Um, so it is quite easy, I think, to install uh, the exporters, uh, which is the, the, primitives one, the Primitives one by default uh, that comes by default uh, with primitives and the and the one on Luster, and um, yeah, we have 
many, many different sort of, uh, of uh, graphs. As we can see, and as we will see, and, and we, have, uh, we can also do stats per device, because sometimes we see a very high load on one device. We want to know uh, who is the responsible for this load, which job ID, or sometimes we want to see why a server is overloaded. So yeah, we can, as we can see, well, this is just uh, uh, four of the dashboards. There are tens of dashboards, of different dashboards. And yeah, we basically, what we basically see is that, uh, so this is, this is one, uh, sorry, this is, this is one of the most interesting ones, which is the disk IO BC, because then I see that someone is probably doing stupid things. In this case, it's okay. It is quite okay, even though we are having very high, very high loads uh, uh, around this this part. But yeah, we can monitor a lot of things, and we can isolate problems quite in an easy way and in a freckle way with uh, with Grafana. Um, so yeah, these these graphs are these dashboards are all available in Grafana. Um, yeah, I've seen that already. Some people uh, downloaded them in the last in the last weeks. And how do we see the future? So continuous education of our child, of our file system, which is alive and which is moving on. Um, we probably need to, uh, we are setting uh, in the very short term alerts on IOPS, alerts on disk IOPC, alerts on CP, server CPU load, all of these thanks to Primitivus alerts, uh, which we, with several wrappers we can, and uh, with several binds we think we can we, we, we will use to open tickets automatically or to send even one day maybe we can think of um, uh, a, a mail that is sent to the user saying that he's maybe doing what he should not do based on a primitive alert. So maybe one day. And the, the, of course the, the last persistent cache on client is extremely useful, especially with AI jobs doing nice things like opening 10,000 10, times per second, opening and closing a file. Um, so this is typically something where we end up sometimes asking, asking our users, uh, please could you copy to local SSD? Um, so instead of sending this, ma this mail to our users, it could be very nice if we can have this feature so how we, our user can already do this uh, in, or we can already set, set up this in, a, in an automatic way. Um, the dynamical data discovery, without any doubt, is a, 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 a great feature. Unfortunately, not available in Luster 2.10, so that's also why we have to add the LNet routers. Um, yeah, last but not least, flash pools with pool quotas. This might be the solution for our problem with uh, user quotas inside project quotas, um, and also a solution to our workloads uh, by having these uh, quotas on, to, on the SSD. Um, on the on the flash on the flash uh, pool, um, but also by creating, well, it's a trick, but you could create uh, a, a flash pool per, or a, a pool a pool quota per per project ID, and then assign the users. It is not such an elegant solution, but it is an alternative that we could think of for the for the user quotas inside the project quotas. Uh, with that, I will be pleased to answer you any of, uh, the, quest of the questions you might have. Thanks for listening. Hello. Um, I really enjoyed that. Like you, you had a very similar model to what we do. I'm, I'm interested about your multi-tenancy with these projects and with the LNet networks, do you, do you know of or do you see any upper limits about like how many of those kind of projects that you might have and tenants, like is, is there anything to be worried about if you took that to kind of extreme levels? So, you know, if you have like a thousand <laughs> yeah. of those subdirectory mounts or projects. Yes, I see. So, uh, right now the only limit I see in this model is uh, that in this side, on this side, this is statically configured on the OSTs and the MDTs, uh, which means that you, we go back to uh, this problem. Uh, which means that right now, with the limit we see on the number of NIDs, LNET NIDs that you can statically configure on a device, 
you might be limited to 18 data sets. I think, and maybe someone here can be more specific about it, that this feature, the dynamic peer discovery, might help you in that case. Because as far as I understand, you, are, you don't need to have this static configuration into the devices then. I don't see why you could not scale above this number of file sets on your client. So, yeah. Thanks. Do you have uh, other questions? Um, just a remark, I think we removed that limit of 16 nits per device somewhere in the work on peer discovery. So, sorry? I think we removed that limit of 60 uh, 36 nit nits per device. In, in, in which version? So. Probably this year is I think it, I think it was done in the peer discovery work, but uh, mm -hmm. I I would need I need to double check. It may now be attunable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I will explore that. I, I don't think it's in 2.10 because our well the problem is that 2.10 might it's very stable, but uh, for instance we have this limit. I'm pretty sure that as soon as we move to 2.12, a lot of these problems might go away. Um, probably dispatches are landed already in 2.12, which might help. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs>